This is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. On December 13th, I spoke with Kyle Missouri, a resident of the Winnemucca Indian Colony in Humboldt County, Nevada, where a long-standing conflict between residents and the Winnemucca Tribal Council has come to a head recently with the evictions of elders, youths, and other residents out into the snow. So for this period, we talk about Kyle's family's roots in the Indian colony, some background on the place and the conflict with the so-called Roja Council, the contested lithium mine at Thacker Pass nearby, and the court challenge to evictions, banishment, and house demolition that's coming up this Thursday, December 15th. Our show notes contain links to other sources of information and ways that you can show up and places that you can donate but I'll list a few right now. You can follow Kyle on Facebook under the name Kyle Missouri, like the state, but with an extra I on the end. And also find an interview that he recently did with B&B Indigenous podcast about an hour and eight minutes in. And you can find interviews with elders who have been evicted and updates on the Instagram page N-E-W-E-N-E-E-N-S-O-K- OPA. You can also learn about background and legal support by following Water Protector Legal Collective on social media and find more of their links at linktree forward slash water protector legal. And you can also donate to the Cash App for supporting displaced families at dollar sign defend WIC. They're looking for more lawyers who can support the efforts as well as journalists who can be on the ground and talking about the situation and reaching out for interviews. And um, be sure to watch the court hearing if you are interested on Thursday. It's linked in the latest update at Water Protector Legal Collective's website, waterprotectorlegal.org. Could you please introduce yourself for the audience with any name, location information, preferred gender pronouns, any, anything that will help get the audience like awareness of who you are? Yeah, no problem. My name is uh, Kyle Missouri. I was, I was uh, born in Windamucca, Nevada. Uh, the first few years of my life, I lived in McDermott, but then I moved to back to Winnemucca because that's where my grandma lives and she has a house there. So that's where I grew up. And at the moment, I'm unemployed because it's just, it's been stressful and I've been worried about leaving my house because there was a points in this whole situation with this whole thing going on that people were afraid their house might just get destroyed when they're gone. Yeah. And so like th- this is kind of just going to be standing um standing alone i can do a little introduction but um for the sake of for the sake of introduction to what's been happening can you talk a bit about like why you why uh you're afraid of house destruction or eviction going on and and um yeah you've already mentioned that yeah like your grandma lives there but you also live there as well right it's actually considered her main residency because it's her house that's where she gets her mail and stuff too but she lives uh in her daughter she stays in reno but in her daughter's house for medical reasons, because she's 88 years old right now. But what happened this week to make you afraid that a house is going to get destroyed? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, there's a lot leading up to it, but specifically this week, I believe it was December 2nd, we had a court appearance, which I knew not, I didn't know about until afterwards. And I assumed it was a, a status update on the ongoing court case that's been going on. But to my surprise, I learned later on from Facebook that there was an order put in place for evictions banishment and a fine of $100 a day starting from December 11th, 2021. So right now it's over $36,000 and they've known just to come in and do whatever they want, make up rules and just go by them. So can you give some context for the uh, Winnemucca Indian colony? Like what the deal is with it, how it came to be, who all lives there and, and the like. Yeah. See, the Winnemucca Indian colony has been there for a long time, even before what they're saying. It's a, you know, a spot where Native Americans have always been, but they didn't take a census on it and they're trying to establish a colony until, I believe, 1916, where they had a list of people who were living there and names. So, But originally, the colony or reservation, I believe it was at first, was uh, two spots that was purchased outside of the town of Winnemucca. But there was nothing out there. People couldn't live out there, and it was too far from town to work. So later on, I believe 1928, around that time, the president bought 
a parcel of land from the railroad company for homeless uh, Native Americans in Nevada. And can you talk about some of the um, some of the nations that live around there? And like when you say homeless Native Americans, like does that mean that uh, folks that were kicked off of reservations or that whatever like lands were quote unquote given were sort of retracted for the the railroad or, or how does that work? Well, the biggest reservation closest to Winnemucca would be uh, Fort McDermott, which was originally uh, a U.S. Army fort during the roundup of Native American people. So they settled a lot of them there. And then once things kind of eased up, you know, from the government, uh, Native Americans kind of just, you know, spread out looking for work and places to live. And a lot of them ended up in uh, McDermott. And there was a people originally there, they called them the sagebrush eaters. And they used to live in that area because it's a range called the Santa Rosa Mountains. And you, as they have the Humboldt River right there where they fished and caught ducks and stuff like that for uh, nutrition. But in this area, it's mostly uh, Western Shoshones and Northern Paiutes. And that's a majority of this area, the Great Basin natives. Uh, if you have an answer to this, that'd be super helpful. But um, in terms of like, what's the difference between a colony and a reservation? Is there one or is it just like the size? See, from my understanding is a reservation is like a larger land spot um, given to the Native Americans to establish a settlement, basically. And a colony is something like within city limits. Oh, okay. Because like uh, there's a few colonies here in Nevada and one of them is in Reno, which is the Reno Spark Tending Colony. And it's like right inside town and city limits just a certain little spot where that are established and another good example is a uh, ely nevada they have two separate portions kind of like winnemucca does they have a reservation and they have a colony the colony is right there in the middle of the town by the main street and their res i mean the colony is and the reservations like just on the outskirts of the town you mentioned like the lawsuit at the beginning and that that being the cause of of these like evictions that have that are happening and that have been escalating recently can you talk about what the lawsuit revolves around and and who's engaged in it and against whom okay well the main lawsuit i believe is just for the right who controls the winnemucca indian colony who's been established as the council and trying to find who actual members of the colony are because they're basing the registration i haven't seen the registration but they're saying that it's based on people who descend from the the Native Americans who were here on 1916 who took the census and who are at least a quarter blood Paiute or Shoshone. They have no, they don't have any lands on any other reservation. And the people who are fighting us as the, the residents, her name is uh, Judy Rojo, her daughter, Misty Don Rojo. And they have a, um, they have a contractor by the name of uh, Bob McNichols. And apparently he was a long time employee of the BIA and he owns a company called the Res Builders. Mm -hmm. And they're against the residents who've been here. And then some of these residents were provided um, agreements with the council to move here because they were trying to make it fill. They're trying to fill the spots up to establish a, a, a government for the Winnemucca, Winnemucca Indian Colony. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned the BIA. So that's the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And um, that that kind of like is like the management agency by the federal government of indigenous communities like that are recognized, right? Yes. And police force and, and whatever that like imposes federal law. Yes. So for instance, I think in the, to give example of your grandma, you had mentioned in that um, B and B um, indigenous podcast the other day that she had gotten the opportunity to, to buy her residence in the colony uh, and had paid that off, had like lived in the community for over 40 years, had raised your father and raised you all. And now you're, you've been taking care of her since then on that property. So she has like, she has her roots there. She worked in the hospital as, did you say she was a nurse for a long time? Yeah. She was a nurse at the humble general hospital in Winnemucca. Uh, a lot of this activity revolves around representation and supposed autonomy within the relation to settler colonial authorities for the audience to understand about like the, the question of like legalism around that. Can you talk about the Winnemucca tribal council um, who, like you've mentioned Rojo and she sits on it, but sort of like anyone else that's memorable, uh, how they got to be there and like 
where they live and if they're if they're residents of the colony itself? Um, with Judy and Misty Donrojo, I believe they're originally from not originally, but they have a property in Chino, California. There's a guy named Shannon Evans. I'm not sure. I've never met him. I've never even met Judy Rojo or her daughter. And there's a couple other people by the last name of Magara. One was Pi Magara, and I can't remember the last one. But as long as I've been on the colony, I've been I've been living there for almost 30 years. I've I've never met those people. I've never seen them. I don't know who they are. I've heard stories. Uh, Judy Rojo saying that she's full blood native, but then I've heard other stories saying that she's um, a, a Hispanic woman. And the McGarris and I think Shannon Evans were considered um, Caucasian. Mm-hmm. But somehow they came into the um, the leadership of this like government recognized tribal council that makes decisions on the property. Yeah, exactly. And, and to my surprise, every legal court we've gone to, we've always asked, "Hey, can we get proof that she's Native American?" Because as a Native American, you're when you're born into the reservation and enrolled, they give you a uh, a CDIB, which stands for a certi- Certificate Degree of Indian Blood, and it shows your blood quantum because a lot of funding and stuff like that, federal funding that goes to reservations goes by percentile. Just There's a school in California called Sherman Indian High School that only allows Native American students in, but they actually have to be at least a quarter blood of uh, Native American. And so, like, I understand that to be kind of a way to prevent other communities um, from taking advantage, like making claims towards the resources, uh, as meager at times as they are that are provided, but like access to profits off of, um, businesses that are run like at times, um, casinos or medical programs that are offered to members of the, of the nation. Right. Yes. So the, I think I read somewhere that the colony is, it's about 20 acres. How many people have been living Living on the colony, how many people have resided there, roughly? Right now, maybe maybe a little less than 30. Mm. Because, like I said, the colony's broken up into two parts. The 20-acre spot is in the middle of the town. Okay. And then the I think it's 320 acres is on the outskirts of the town. The tribal council is technically in control of, in terms of how the, the federal government looks at them, both of those, or are they just for the um, for the colony? Like the small 20 acre. They're actually looking at both of them, but our concern is the 20 acres because that's where we live. Yeah. That's, you know, that's where we've been established for years. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And on the on the other outskirts, they opened up a, mar- a marijuana dispensary through uh, federal funding. And like I said, with the blood quantum, it's usually supposed to help, you know, cases like this, like fraud, basically. Mm-hmm. Stealing, you know, receiving money under false pretenses. Did they open the dispensary as as a tribal business that would go to benefit the common um, needs of people in the community, such as elders? Yes. Yeah. They even had, they had like a, a vegetable garden too. And they were given like the red, cause there's certain residents that are allowed to stay in the colony. And then, and then there's us, the other residents who are evicted and banned. Is that, is that banishment and eviction like based on their claim that, that folks don't have like, a paper trail or that you're just on a, a place that they have eminent domain over or what is that? What are they claiming with that? Well, a lot of times that they've asked us in court is if we're enrolled at another reservation, most of us are because there's no enrollment in Winnemucca, Mm -hmm. but there's no rule against dual enrollment in Winnemucca. Mm -hmm. But most of us are enrolled uh, in McDermott, which is 69 miles North of here. And a couple of people are in Lovelock. And I think there's some from Senna Lake, but the people who are on the colony, I'm related to pretty much everyone there, but they're allowing certain individuals to stay while evicting others who are against what they were doing. But her base, her basis is saying that we have no claim, mm-hmm. that we don't have any eligibility to be part of the tribe, mm-hmm. even though we do. My grandma was just telling me stories about her mother, who when she was a child, she'd come to Winnemucca and spend time with her brother who lived on Winnemucca and uh their mom and my my great grandma was born in 1899 so you can only imagine yeah how far back it goes yeah that definitely like would predate the 1916 or 1928 dates yeah exactly and then she talked about other relatives because there's a list of actual um people on the census 
and she'd look at it and say, it was like, oh yeah, we're related to them or related to them. And I'm like, of course, it's a small area. We're pretty much related to everybody in this area. I mean, I got family in Oahe, another reservation up by Idaho, mm-hmm. uh, Pyramid Lake. I have family in Reno Sparks. I have family in Lovelock. <laughs> I have family in McDermott. I have family in uh, California in uh, the Pitt River. Hmm. But what she's doing, it amazes me. It's just, it really is, you know, colonization mm-hmm. unfolding in front of everybody. It's non native people. And we're assuming non native because they refuse to prove it, even though every member on the colony could prove it because we're given our, an ID card saying we are. But it's non natives coming, kicking natives off Native American land to use for their own funding, for their own good. Because I don't know what the money went. They got COVID money too from the American, the American Health Program. Mm-hmm. And then they got a EPA, EPA funding to clean up the reservation. And I'm not even sure what else they have. So one thing um, besides that, there was um, there were some conflicts that have been this this conflict has been going for a long time, and it it seems like the conflict around like questions of legitimacy and tribal government governance has been um, going on for a couple decades in terms of that that um, like that tribal council. But um, the Winnemucca colony lies near to Thacker Pass, which is a traditional territory, um, as you said, like of, of a number of indigenous nations in and around so-called Humboldt County, Nevada. Um, importantly, there are deposits of lithium clay and um, that that industry and the settler state want to be used for things like for phones, for laptops, for electric cars, home solar relays. Like those are just the things that I could think of off the top of my head that lithium is getting mined for it on a large scale and other so-called like green energy things. Um, do you think that this is there any relation, do you think, between the the push to like cleanse out certain people from the like from the colony, um, do you think that there's any relation to like the push to open this mining process or do you think it just, it's just another tension in the community? I've never, I haven't seen anything like that, but I've heard rumors and I've, you know, just speculating, just kind of seeing things that are happening. It it did seem like that because there were rumors going by that she was going to destroy all the houses. And then she wanted to build like uh, condos and stuff to help the miners go back and forth from work. And then there was, then there was a. Uh, the timing was kind of weird just recently because next month they have a Thacker Pass oral ar- argument going on, and we just get hit with this out of nowhere. Because mm-hmm. at one point, they they in I believe that they said I can't be hundred percent, but they said that they were for the mine. And then later on, when this this started getting more outreach, they were saying, "Oh no, they're against the mine." And that the, the BLM didn't confer with the Winnemuck Indian Colony because a lot of the people from the colony are from McDermott who fight that, who are fighting against Thacker Pass. Mm-hmm. But it's a whole, like I said, we're all related. So it's a whole family thing. Everybody, we got people from Wahi at Thacker Pass. We got McDermott, we got Pyramid Lake. We have AIM was out there. There's a bunch of different organizations trying to go against that. But to me, it just, you know, it's oddly suspicious to how it's happening because when you're coming or going to the mine that they're building, what they want to build, Winnemucca is the biggest town to it because there's Winnemucca, then there's actually the town of McDermott. And it goes right to the mine. So either they're going to stay in McDermott or they're going to stay in Winnemucca. Yeah, and it seems funny if like the the council like government that's supposed to be representative of the community, like people aren't being informed about or there's no like sort of like consent discussion around like, well, what do you all think about this thing? Um, doesn't sound very like democratic. Oh no, I've seen a couple of the meetings in McDermott when they're talking about it, and it just seemed completely, you know, every from what I've when I saw some of them, it was everybody against it, except there's a a certain couple that were seemed to be trying to vouch for it. But usually, I mean, what what it all comes down to is just money. That's the that's the main thing that happens. I've read articles on the Thacker Pass, and out of curiosity, I go and look at the comments. And maybe 90% of the comments were just talking about money or how much someone invested or how much they think they should invest or asking why it's being postponed and should be opened already. And that's that's everybody's concern. They don't, they don't care about 
you know, pretty much tribal sovereignty because there was we, they've had um, appeals set in for considering a um, burial the burial spot there or historic land spot for native uh, for the northern Paiute Shoshones, but that was denied by the federal court. Like they don't recognize it. As yeah, they said there's just not enough evidence to base it on that. In that same interview that I was mentioning, the 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 Facebook Live that you participated in, I think it was brought up the. Uh, like display of red dresses symbolizing missing and murdered indigenous women that were being displayed that were removed by either private contractors or law enforcement or, or something. And you had talked about like rumors, at least that the, that the land that's cleared that people are being evicted from now could be condos that would be, um, that would be used for housing minors. Um, I mean, that's basically, a, that's what they call like a man camp, right? Yeah. Um, can you talk about some of the concerns to your understanding of like why why like why bring in the um missing and murdered indigenous women symbology to this and like what people are afraid of with a man camp coming into the neighborhood? See, the man camp I think I'm pretty sure that was debunked because there was a guy who actually had um record of showings like where they actually they they do want to put a man camp, but it's not going to be on the colony. I believe it's going to be somewhere else, but still, it's it's still a dangerous thing. My brother used to work in the, the Dakotas. He worked on the pipelines there at one point, and he said guys would just get drunk on their days off, go cause problems on the reservations, and leave. He said they'd take advantage of the women there and abuse the guys and all that kind of stuff. He said he got tired of it, and he quit and came back to Nevada. But with the uh, – the red dresses were up just to show solidarity for us supporting the missing and murdered indigenous women because it's a sad thing and it happens and these situations do lead to it. Yeah. And we, the residents are the ones who told me because I've missed it, but it showed the residents were saying they're tearing down the, the red dresses. And for what reason? If Judy Rojo is saying that she's Native American, why would she do that? Why wouldn't she approve of that? And we put it on the fences to show another sign because Judy Rojo actually built a barbed wire fence, a six foot fence around the colony, blocking people. Then at one point there was a gate up there. I got locked out one time when I was coming home. Who was manning the gate? Uh, Bob McNichols. Oh, okay. This private contractor who works with yeah. Rojo. Yeah, he's a, like I said, he's a owner, CEO, whatever he'd like to call himself of the res builders. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess getting back to the folks that were evicted, can you, um, like, if you don't have to name anyone you don't want to, but like, can you talk at least about like, sort of the kind of people that have been evicted and, uh, what's happened to their property and, um, sort of what kind of a little more about like, where are they at right now? What kind of conditions are they in? As of right now, they are surviving on donations that people have sent because of stories that they're hearing or they see it firsthand right now they're staying in a motel uh, in the casino i believe and they're all there just trying to wait to see what happens from the beginning one person last year i believe it was house completely destroyed they gave her like a couple hours to get what she wanted and they destroyed it pretty much right in front of her and in doing that they actually punctured a, a fuel line a gas line and they left it open Another time they were ripping off, um, railing off someone's trailer. They shut off people's power. They shut people's water off. They tore someone's shed down. They they just tried to clear everything out. And they kept saying that they have the authority to do it when they actually never did. And most of these people are, like I said, are elders. They're older people. They're on disability. They can't work. One of them supply uh, runs on. He had a generator hooked up to his house to keep himself warm. I gave him firewood when I had a tree that I cut down. I gave him firewood. They're usually on, like I said, disability, social security. Uh, my neighbor's on disability, but at least he got to stay because he's not very mobile. And then there's small kids, and I'm, I know a couple of them are. Uh, they're on the spectrum, I believe. And they don't know what's going on. You know, they're just wondering why they can't go home. They've destroyed, they destroyed a house last year, which was put on Facebook. A lot of people saw them while they were destroying the house. 
they destroyed it and they kicked the guys out and then they didn't allow them to get all their stuff, but they threw all their stuff on the ground and told them they could pick it up later. And then they were turned there was a building on there for the tribal like tribal meetings and stuff like that. They had court there at times before that they turned into a jail. They put it in a wall, they put it in cells. And I don't even think there'd be any kind of regulation on that. I don't even think that'd be approved by any kind of authority. Because you got to have certain, yeah, you, you have to have certain things to be able to be considered a jail and government operated. And I don't think they'd be able to even do that in that small area. Otherwise, it's just kidnapping. Yeah, it's just locking someone in the house, basically, or a building. And and I think it's like worth noting that, I mean, most 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 people are not homeowners. Most people don't have like. A lot. Most people are renters in this country, um, to my understanding. Mm-hmm. Like that causes a lot of destabilization. It, it and a house is a way that um, that like working class people can actually like save some money for themselves or maybe build up a little bit of like economic stability. And so going in and and demolishing people's houses without recourse is a terrible burden on on people that, as you said, are in a lot of cases already on like disability or unemployment or on social security because they're retired because they're too old to work um yeah that seems like a really dangerous position to put people in yeah and specifically with my grandma she was part of a program called the mutual help and occupancy program and it's for low income indigenous people to actually purchase a house and that's what she did back in in the 70s she got approved for it she started paying for the house, and once all the payments were up to pay for the house, the deed was signed over to her. But they're still saying that they can't, that she's, you know, nobody's allowed on there but her. I was like, how does that work? She has family. She's, she, has, she had three kids. And then right now, I just found out today that they boarded up my windows and my door and my house because I'm out of town right now. So I am going third uh, tomorrow, which is Wednesday. I'm going back because that's my expected time, and I'm going home. I don't care what they say. I'm going to go take down all the boards, whatever they did, and go to home. That's where I pay my bills. I was raised there. <laughs> I was born in Winnemucca. But other people are probably going to get it worse because they brought their own trailers here. Some of them did. Some of them brought their own trailers here because they were told they could stay here. And the, the, the then council said, all right, here's your spot, you know, that will hook everything up and you should be good. And that's what they did. And now they're just destroying them. And the thing is, everything that they say is lies. And it's amazing how they go through court. Because at one point, Ms. Judy Rojo was saying that she was related to the, the past chairman. Then she was just saying that the chairman was her mentor. Then she went back to saying her chairman. Then she was saying who she's related to on the the roster from 1916, then it kept changing. And she just refuses to give up information to prove it. And the thing is, it was asked in Ninth Circuit Court before. And they still never answered it, and they lost in the Ninth Circuit Court. So we're still amazed on how this is still going on with these lower courts, because we just got lowered to another court from a CFR court, because there's different levels of courts. Then I got the update yesterday that we have another... What is it? Another stay on the order of eviction on the on Thursday, which is the 15th in the morning for oral arguments to say this is wrong. Yeah, because the last day, the last day order was denied by a court and then they basically said, all right, it's out of our hands until the, the next higher court, like until it gets argued in the next court. Yeah. Yeah. And in the meantime, people's houses are are being destroyed while it's still being argued in see i'm not sure if they're being destroyed yet they might be waiting but they're you know restricting access to the colony even the people who live in winnemucca the bia was pulling people over without no probable cause just because they drive on the colony to get pulled over and they were arresting people i've seen them tow someone's car like obviously so i guess like things are going to come to another head on thursday when there's these oral arguments and this this um this like court proceedings, but like, and stopping the permanent eviction of people from homes is, is paramount. And it sounds like from what I understand, um, during the evictions, the feds 
from different agencies were brought in and some people are already facing charges who maybe like can't be on the ground without facing additional charges. So there's already like a bunch of people who would be there at least protesting or whatever, trying to stop the, the, these evictions or destruction of house of houses. If the tribal council decides to move forward with that, how can people who are in the area uh, who are not already engaged, how can they offer help? What would you like for them to do? Well, like I said on my podcast with the BNB Indigenous, right now the biggest thing that we need is just legal help because what we have is NLS, Nevada Legal Services, which has been fighting this case for with us this whole time. It's basically a public defender's office, so they're probably overloaded on cases. they got to go to different areas just to defend other people so they don't have time, especially a case of this scope because it's been going on for decades. And legal help would probably be one one of the biggest things so we could actually fight it, even if we lose the stay order, we could still file more motions, which I've I filed some motions on my own when I first got when I first got involved in twenty twenty again, because I was gone for a little bit. And I wasn't actually represented until last year. So a lot of the time I was getting advice from the NLS to how to do my paperwork. But now it just seems like like I said, with their cases, they have case overloads. We just need a lot more legal help. And, of course, we need for them to place a stay. They've contacted Winnemucca, like, indigent services, and they said they could help to a certain point. And we've had people donate already. But the thing is, I don't know where, if the money's being distributed, equal, not equally, but, you know, but who needs it most and who needs it what. Because they do have a cash app, but I'm not sure who actually manages that. Because I've never needed help with the financial side. But right now, they don't have anywhere to go, so they're staying in motels. And you know how motels are. They could be expensive. You know, they need food. They need water. They need shelter. They probably need gas because some of them still got to go to the store and do stuff. And with the, the price of gas nowadays. But I do have a cash app. And they're saying it's everybody. So that's all I have right now. Yeah. And I'll, and it's, if you want to name that cash app, then that's great. I'll put it in the show notes too. Yeah. It's, um, money sign defend wick. The wick is uh, all capitalized, but the defend is all lowercase. Yeah. I saw that the, the water protectors legal collective is, is helping out on this and they've been doing some updates on their site. Which is good. Which doesn't mean that you don't yes, need more legal that's, help. That's but. actually, you know, that'd probably be a better place to reach them because they have different setups due to uh, legal reasons. There's, I think, there's a link on there to show exactly direct support for the Native American for the elders. And oh, the awesome! Kids. Awesome! Cool, cool. So people could just go to that too. I saw one thing on social media requesting for people to come and witness, especially video videographers, people who could record it. And it sounded like you've been doing a lot of work to talk and get the word out about what's going on. Um, there's also this this Instagram page where you can see short interviews. It's N-E-W-E-N-E-E-N-S-O-K-O-P-A that has a lot of like interviews with folks and photos from the colony, uh, but interviews with folks who are in hotels, like who have been evicted, kind of talking about their story and their struggle. Yeah. And so like... Do you need do you need journalists to go out there and do you need like do you want other media to be contacting you like I'm kind of surprised I haven't Yo. heard something like this on Democracy Now which has a pretty big reach. Oh yes, more than yeah, that's what happened last year. We had a member who contacted the Colway News which is at Reno, Reno, Nevada. He contacted them to try and tell our story, but Judy Rojo kind of shoved her way in. And just told her side of the story and then listen to any of the residents. And then Cola White just ran a story on it. And then even with the local newspaper, it was Winnemucca Humble Sun at the time, or Humble Count Humble Sun at the time, I think it switched. But they ran an article too, which basically showed in favoritism towards Judy Rojo mm -hmm. with false claims of drug addicts and violent people and stuff like that. And I, I told, went on there and said, how are you going to say these people are violent and stuff when they're old? They could barely get around. What are they going to do? Mm -hmm. But Judy Rojo insists that they're violent. When that gate was up, she was insisting that or they were ramming into the, the J-rail or threatening her with the gun when nobody was even there. 
Yeah, there's a couple of stories on the Nevada Independent um, that are pointed to from the Water Protectors Legal Collective, which I think are like, they seem pretty even handed um, and sort of point out like where some of the points where the conflict is stemming from. I guess. Yeah, because I've tried to ask the the newspaper to run something and they were going to do it until Judy Rojo sent them another letter of what she wanted to publish and then the newspaper said they don't want to be involved with this. Yeah. They're not going to run stories either way. So that kind of, that silenced us at the same time with the community. We didn't get our, we didn't get an opportunity to say what, who we are and what we do. We didn't get to tell our story, even though they just painted a bad picture of saying lies and everybody seemed to be believing them. Or, or the media source was the, the media platform was just like, this sounds complicated uh, we don't have the resources or interest in order to like try to figure out like who's telling the truth in this or, or, or some like sense of like quote unquote fairness of hearing both sides of a story or whatever that is. Yeah. see, I was kind of assuming that too. And then that's what I was thinking with the whole lithium mine thing too, because I think more eyes going to be on that than anything, especially in Nevada. Mm-hmm. Cause they've had tons of supporters and I'm, you know, I'm glad for that and I hope they could get more because it, that's wrong too. The, all this is, going down and it's wrong and it's all for money mm-hmm. native americans we didn't have money like that when we were first here we lived by what we had what we took from the land and we only took what we needed we didn't try and take more than we needed to destroy the land because we're a part of it we don't live to conquer we live to be with it because that's what we do the earth take care of us and we take care of the earth but now it just seems like people are just destroying everything destroying homes destroying connections destroying the land for personal gain yeah yep and extraction and displacement are like really really tightly connected right yeah so you said there's the intertribal court of appeals of nevada hearing in the morning on december 15th there's information about how to get onto the zoom call that'll be in the show notes for this and that also is up on the water protector legal collective website Um, for folks who want to see that which is calling for a stay of the eviction and banishment which that lower court already denied Um, you've mentioned cash app and like sending donations for like i'm sure that there's information about donations for legal support for funding the lawyers because it does cost money to to like file paperwork and do research Um, and then there's that cash app is what are some other and getting videographers down there and like media to cover this um, is there anything that we haven't talked about in this? Anything at all that you want to bring up? From the legal sense, not really. There's still, you know, to me, there's still a lot of hearsay. And I've tried to stay out of this for so long, like just lay low. I wasn't trying to play the, the social media game. I was trying to go by the legals, get the paperwork in, get evidence, and hope for the best. But at this point, it just seems like that's gone nowhere. So that's what I've been trying to do is just get this out in the public to let people actually see what's going on. So they actually see what colonization actually is and what it does right now. It's destroying these houses and these families. They're living in a motel right before Christmas and it's heartbreaking. They don't know what to do. They don't have the money. They don't have the legal assistance. They don't have, they don't have much of anything. The best thing to do is just get the word out and maybe the right person, the right attorney or, Anybody could hear something and see what they can do from their point. Cause I'm not a professional in anything. I'm not a, I'm not a host. I'm not a journalist. I'm not a lawyer. I'm none of that. I'm just one guy who's just trying to live in peace. Mm-hmm. But I think the main thing right now, cause it's snowy in Winnemucca and it's cold. It's just to make sure they have a place to stay where they don't have to worry about being in the cold. Cause they don't have like a homeless shelter in Winnemucca. It's just indigent services, and sometimes you don't even know. Sometimes they don't even approve you for that. And the people went amok. Just kind of just stood by and watched it, probably expecting someone else is going to do something. But it didn't work out that way. Now look at it. They closed off the colony again. They evicted these elders. They evicted kids, and they kept a certain specific few who they like to stay on the colony, even though they're in the same position as us. They have no tie to the colony or this and that, and they're allowed to stay. Just because we spoke out against it, we're the ones evicted. Just like any kind of tyranny or dictatorship that happened, you start speaking up against something that's more powerful than you, they try and silence it. 
Yeah, and once once people's homes with all of their like family heirlooms and their, you know, whatever, like get destroyed, that's not something that can just be replaced with a court order or like a stay of a stay of demolition won't bring back someone's family photos or or, you know, the walls that have kept them sheltered for so long that they have, you know, that generations have, have lived in together. Like, yeah, it seems super time sensitive. And like you said, yeah, there's no price on that. You can't, you can't pay a price on a memory. I look at, I go through my house still, and I remember all the old stuff that I had when I was a child. I remember when it looked like this or when this changed in the house, who was staying where, because several people lived in the house, me, my little cousins, my dad, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my my brother, pretty much all my families have stayed there at one point. And that was the house that we all went to as children to play. That's the place where we'd go to spend time with family. It was always home. Now we're in the process of losing that. Which we which we shouldn't be able to legally anyways. We have all these paperwork, but they keep denying them. Mm-hmm. Because every Memorial Day, when I was a kid, we'd go to McDermott to clean our graves and pay our respect to the ones that passed. Then we'd stay in McDermott for a little bit. Then we'd come back to Winnemucca and then I'll sit there and eat and talk and catch up. Thanksgivings. We've had Christmases. And I'm sure the same goes for the rest of the families. They've had their Christmases. They've had family arrangements. They've had losses. And now they're losing more to stuff they might have hold dear that that person left them. Well, um, Kyle, thanks a lot for, thanks a lot for talking and, um, I'm going to get this up, um, and out as soon as possible. It probably won't be before tomorrow morning, but, <clears throat> but I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and, um, I hope that this helps get word out and, um, yeah, uh, wish you good luck and keep, please like keep in touch if you have other things you want, you want us to like pass along. Okay. I appreciate it. And it's like I said, anything helps at this moment. Just hope someone could hear it. Um, okay, and yeah, if you have um, if you have any links that you want to share me uh, or share with me, then like if you think of anything today or tonight to send me to to include with it, then I'm really happy to to include it in there. If there's any other like fundraisers or anything that or other things like that, the Instagram's good because it's got a bunch of links for fundraising and it's also got videos of folks uh which is pretty like heartbreaking like hearing people yeah, talk about because like, i'm like i said i'm going back tomorrow yeah and yeah. i'm going to film it if they try and arrest me yeah i'm going to put it on my facebook live we'll definitely link to your facebook then in in that yeah and, yeah all right have a good night and good luck all right thank you you yeah, too take care this is The Final Straw. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. No, 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 no